if you have good thought they will shine out of your face like sunbeams and you will look lovely good morning to one and all as we all know today's webinar is on the topic i rise i help others rise let us start the session by getting the blessings of almighty i request sneha m to lead us ma'am you can prayer. continue jnana vinayagane jnan vinayagane charanam jnan vinayagane charanam nallavane matrellam vallavane varakshi jnan vinayagane வானமளாவியமோர் விசித்திரம் கண்டேன் வானமளாவியமோர் விசித்திரம் கண்டேன் வண்ணவனே மெய் பரமானந்தம் கொண்டேன் ஞான விநாயகனே சரணம் நல்லவனே மற்றெல்லாம் வல்லவனே வருகி பிரணவ உண்மையுட்பொருளே ஓமெனும் பிரணவ உண்மையுட்பொருளே ஓதும் கம்பீர நாட்டை காக்கும் நற்றருளே ஓமெனும் பிரணவ உண்மையுட்பொருளே ஓதும் கம்பீர நாட்டை காக்கும் நற்றருளே சுவாமி சரவணசன் தமிழ் தனக்கருளே சுவாமி சரவணசன் தமிழ் தனக்கருளே திரு சமரசம் எனும் அழகு தங்கும் ஜெகமதிலிங்கும் புகழது பொங்கும் பரம ஞான விநாயகனே சரணம் நல்லவனே மற்றெல்லாம் வல்லவனே வரும் ஸ்ரீ ஞான விநாயகனே CMS College of Science and Commerce established in 1988 is one of the premier institution of higher learning in Coimbatore it is affiliated to babian university and approved by aict and ugc cms college of science and commerce aggregated at a plus level by nac with 3.38 out of 4 college is also recognized under the star college scheme dbt ministry of science and technology government of india presently the college is running a variety of undergraduate postgraduate and doctorate programs across various specializations now i request dr mrudra ravindran head department of mathematics cms college of science and commerce to welcome the to give to deliver the welcome address So, first of all, let me uh, thank our management principal and uh, Srinivas Chakravarti sir, Mr. Vikram, everyone for uh, uh, the, uh, for happening this program today. So, first of all, let me welcome uh, our management office bearers, secretary, chairman, vice chairman, treasurer, and joint secretary, on behalf of CMS College of Science and Commerce, and all on behalf of all the participants. Next, I welcome our Uh, today's renowned and uh, very resourceful person professor srinivas chakravarti uh, so to welcome him i don't know what words i can use to welcome him such a simple humble and uh, down to earth person because we, I, we haven't met anyone and we haven't talked or so just mr vikram i happened to contact mr vikram he came to our college once and through him i could get this resource person such a wonderful resource person Uh, i have no words to thank him for uh, accepting our invitation and uh, joining us today so on behalf of cms college of science and commerce 
the management principal staff and students and all the participants i extend a warm 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 welcome to you professor srinivas chakravarti sir welcome you i extend a warm welcome to all the participants also and uh, sincere welcome to mr vikram who has uh, made this program happen I welcome all the members of my department and all the uh, staff members of this college and all the students of our college and above all once again i welcome all the participants without whom this cannot happen so once again i welcome each and every one of you welcome thank you thank you ma'am now i request dr shrija associate professor department of mathematics to introduce the resource person good morning everyone dr v shrinivas chakravarti is professor at iit madras he obtained his basic degree in electrical engineering and did post doctorate in neuroscience he is a motivational speaker and is author author of over 60000 60 plus books on varied topics of popular science and also history he has been mentoring students research scholars to bring out their fullest potential he has demonstrated the ability of transforming ordinary students into gems by giving reasonable freedom and providing the right ambience he is good at connecting to students showing empathy on research front he has several publications in world's top most journals conferences in recognition of his merit he was awarded projects worth 3 plus crores both from public and private sectors of these over 2 plus crore worth projects are successfully completed which shows his ability to lead multiple teams which are multi demand the projects taken up are those which the society is in real need with the outbreak of covid nowadays giving more talks on motivation and career guidance as it is the need of the heart instilling confidence in students in the last one year or so he has given such inspiring lectures across the country showing the ways ahead he is one who strongly believed in nurturing the natural ta natural talents with proper guidance as against bossism and this strategy has been yielding good results what it makes to be a leader will be illustrated with 15 plus real life instances during the talk we are sure that this interactive webinar on i rise i help others rise will benefit the students and faculty immensely in knowing and mastering the science of success we are fortunate to have you with us today sir thank you thank you very much uh, good morning everyone and again like to thank uh, dr mrudula ravindran head maths department cms college of science and commerce and thanks again to my good friend vikram uh, who makes this uh, wonderful meetings happen and uh, this is a great opportunity for me to you know, speak to you this morning uh, can i share my screen uh, yes you can see the slides right Yes, sir. It is not in R. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Sir. So, good morning, everyone. And uh, so, uh, the title of my talk is I it rise. It is uh, not at full screen, sir. It is not at full screen. I put it in full screen. How about now? Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, the title of my talk is I rise. I help others rise. motivation career guidance for students so i have been giving this kind of talks for the last uh, one one and a half years uh, in outside our institute uh, because you know last years have been quite difficult for us world over we have been seeing the uh, kind of a damage done by covid uh, to to common lives so especially i have been noticing that the students are really hit very hard uh, you know whether it's college students or school school kids Uh, it's very difficult for them to force them to you know, stay indoors and not go out, not meet their friends. 
and there are a lot of people are undergoing depression so mm-hmm. i thought uh, some kind of motivation would help help them get back to their you know their normal lives and carry on with their with their studies so covid is one reason currently uh, for depression but if you look at the general life of uh, an engineering student because that's these are the examples i see every day uh the kind of difficult times come in the typically in the final semester so if you look at the life of an average uh, btech student at iit so the preparation for je starts uh, at least 4 years before uh, the exam and they go through rigorous coaching and somehow let's say some people get into the institute and after that in you know, the first year you know goes on merrily and because a new atmosphere new world a new freedom and you know they just they're very happy and first few years just pass by uh, you know you don't even notice it but uh, when they come to final year uh, they're facing a very serious challenge because uh, when once you are into iit there's a huge build up a huge expectation from not only your siblings your family your relatives from society at large that so this uh, student is going to do something wonderful is going to get a you know one crore salary a job in you know in some management uh, position or you know will go to go abroad to some top school in the world and things like that and when the final results are coming right and they they, they don't match this expectation uh, the students are typically depressed they worried about what admissions they are getting what jobs they are getting and things like that so as you can see that the big reason behind this depression is that up to that point in their lives they have been living some kind of a world driven life that is your decisions are not yours somebody is making those decisions for you and somebody is pushing you you know they were like a wound up toy right so somebody is winding you up and you just have to go on and uh, once the winding up uh, the, the the potential energy is rise, rise runs out you just stop you know you are depressed so let me give an example uh, so once a senior ias officer brought his daughter for some je council so this girl just got some rank in uh, in a je and uh, the, her father wants to know what are her chances so he came with his uh, you know family his whole entourage you know with uh, pun holding his briefcase and things like that so father came and he started talking and he was explaining that you know for the rank that his daughter got as uh, she would get chemical in it madras and mechanical in it bombay etc etc and so, so he said that she'll take whatever is the best opportunity for us for her and after that she will do mba and go to certain iim and then or she will write civil services and go to ias etc etc so thing is this father has charted out her, the entire trajectory of the his daughter's life for the next 6 or you know maybe even 10 years right when somebody is completely programming your life like that uh this is not very likely that your life is full of joy because uh, you know life the first secret of life a like, happy life is freedom freedom to choose right even if you make mistakes that's okay but you have to your life should be in your control when that doesn't happen temporarily when you get this you know uh transient successes you might feel happy but otherwise in the long run depression is in store definitely so but why can't people be totally free and self motivated and you know go wherever they want do whatever they want and uh, you know experience every kind of success in life why doesn't happen like like the way the superman is doing what is stopping you so there are many reasons e- each person has a different reason uh, so some people say that you know i come from a middle class family so i don't have many opportunities or somebody might say that they come from a certain religion or caste which is a minority and therefore they are at a disadvantage or i come from a backward region like a small village or something like that or is this a male dominated society and i'm a woman or a girl and i don't have opportunities or too much corruption in the system <laughs> or i don't have connections i need to have connections i need to have push right in this uh, system which has a lot of nepotism our government is not creating enough jobs so there are many reasons each person has you know, their own reason but i would like to say that uh, you know these are not really reasons but they're excuses right uh, let's take some counter examples srinivas ramanujan abdul kalam rajesh and rakesh and they're all from middle class families really low middle class families right and rakesh and wala is from a you know a far east his father is a chartered a chartered accountant and he is considered the warren buffett of india one of the richest you know, persons in india so i belong to certain minority caste or religion you know pick again abdul kalam or ramnath kovil right backward region forgot sisters you might have seen the movie dangal right by amir khan this is a male dominated society you know look at the stories of chanda kochar or arunathi bhattacharya or indra nui i mean 
just consider what are the positions that a woman is not able to occupy these days. Right, the highest positions are being occupied by women these days. So TN session, one man single-handedly could control corruption in the elections, you know, election commission. Right, all that it takes is a will and a pure will. Right, that's what he showed. A connection, lack of connections, it didn't stop Ranveer Singh. Right, uh, so it, it's a it's a question of talent. Uh, not government not creating enough jobs. Let me tell you some statistic from the, within the IIT system. Within the IIT system, this is I mean uh, data is from a couple of years ago, but I think it doesn't change much. Um, there are at least thousand faculty jobs vacant within the IIT system. This is we're talking about 23 institutes, right? Imagine what is the situation with you know if you look at the hundreds of uh, higher education institutions all over the country. Right. So the thing is, it's not that there are no jobs, it's that uh, it's just that there are not enough qualified people to fill those positions. So the thing is, if you want to have a great career, right, well, the first secret is uh, not the question, most important question that you need to ask is not where there are jobs and where the opportunities and where there are positions open and all that stuff. Right. The first question you need to ask is you need to ask yourself, what do you like to do? What's the singular goal of your life? What's the why behind all your actions? Right? What are the kinds of things you enjoy doing naturally without anybody telling you? What is the line of work that makes you not scared of Mondays? Some people make a big drama about Mondays. Right? I mean, you might have seen your uncles or aunts or parents saying, oh, it's Monday again, I need to go to work. If that's the kind of work you are doing, you're in the wrong, you know, wrong occupation. Right? Um, so what is the kind of work that you are, I mean, paradoxically speaking, you would willingly do even without a salary? Right? If there is a job which you will do without a salary, it's so enjoyable, right? Uh, then that's the kind of work, uh, you, know, uh, you know, ironically, will get you most money, right? So what is that kind of work? Do you know what it is for you? So first thing you need to ask yourself is, is the, what the goal of your life? Now, not only individuals, even institutions have goals and motors, right? The central, uh, you know, coordinating principles of their entire uh, organization. So all their activities, circ you know, go around, revolve around, uh, you know, that central motto. Right, that's why they are able to you know, succeed so well. Take, for example, the Tech Talks company. Right, their their uh, motto is to spread ideas. Very simple motto: to spread ideas in uh, in the areas of technology and you know uh, education and design. So basically, spread important ideas, ideas which are impactful, useful to the society. So they call all these you know important speakers and uh, let them share their experiences with the society. So they are a very successful organization. Or Microsoft, their goal was to bring the personal computer to every home. At a time when computers were so large, they looked like you know Almeras, right? And uh, they fill the entire hall. Uh, they, they said, let's make a computer which can which you can take home with you, right? And uh, uh, and then put it on your desktop. So they became so successful because everything they did went you know fo was focused towards that goal. Or take Tesla for example, the to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. So the thing is, organizations start off with a goal and then they do everything to reach that goal. In the process, they become big. Individuals also do the same. Let's take an example of Afroz Shah. So Afroz is a young lawyer, Mumbai-based lawyer. He, I think he just got a job in High Court, Mumbai High Court. And he was looking for an apartment to stay. <laughs> so he was uh, going with this, uh, you know, uh, this apartment you know, agent. And he went to a building and he was looking at uh, different apartments in that building. So it's a high-rise building, and from one of the floors, when he looked back, it, this is on the on the on a beach, you know, the Versava beach. He saw a strange sight. Uh, there was a, he saw something like a long uh, white road on the on the beach. He was puzzled because usually roads are black or grey, but this looked white. I mean, so he was wondering what is this white road, the white strip of you know road. So he came down and he saw, and to his uh, shock, I saw that it's it's not a road; it's a big pile of trash. Right? So this uh, pile was several feet high and say, a few hundred meters long, and he was really shocked. You know, he couldn't understand how somebody could throw so much trash on such a beautiful, beautiful beach. So he went around asking, talking to people, and nobody cared. Nobody had an idea. Right? Nobody cared. Basically, it's not nobody had an idea. So the municipality kept dumping this all this trash there. Uh, so he was wondering whether to do something about it because it's a huge challenge and you know if the whole society has abandoned that challenge how can he take it out so he then at this point he had a kind of a dilemma and to answer this dilemma shirbindo says in this quotation if thy aim be great thy means small still act 
for by action alone can these things accrue to thee so very often we see huge problems in society right and then you quickly see you know decide that the problems are too big for you for your capacity right so you don't even worry about it you don't even think about it but what shirvin says here is if you have a goal which is very big right don't hesitate to uh, hesitate to take it up right go ahead and plunge into action because only by action the, your strength will grow your right your capacity will grow your mental caliber will grow your insights will grow your stamina will grow your help you know your resources and help from other people all that will grow uh, only if you plunge into action you get into action if you just contemplate you know sit and think about it nothing will happen so that's exactly what afros uh, did he he got into action he wanted to just get down and start clearing trash by all by himself but then he thought let me ask somebody if somebody can help so he asked around in his apartment building and nobody helped uh, nobody came forward to help but this old gentleman called madhur ji he said uh, you know afros let me help you let's go and do something so this 85 85 year old gentleman and this young chap both of them you know went down and started clearing trash after a days work they they were able to clear five bags of trash so a journey began that's a great beginning but a very humble beginning because they quickly realized that at this rate they are not going to go very far so afros start talking to people around so that's a that's a beach so there was a fisherman community there so he went and talked to them explained to them the hazards of you know living alone living this so much trash around so he says you know pyar se logon ko judna hai you should you should bring together people you know and you uh, know with with love and affection so he talks to them nicely explains to them and then some people come forward to help he goes to nearby schools and colleges and talks to students and explains to them and so he was able to enlist a whole army of helpers and all these guys start you know clearing the trash uh, you know bit by bit and at that point it would be really shocking to know that uh, such a nice work has been uh you know marred and and uh, interrupted by these fellows and somebody sent some goons right to threaten this people to stop what whatever they were doing uh so we they don't know who did it but uh, this they explained to them no no we are not going to stop you can do whatever you want so the goons threaten them and go away but nothing happens so like that this group clears 9 million kg of trash right uh, and undertaking the largest beach cleanup activity in the world So hearing this wonder, uh, this reporter called Dhruv Rathi uh, goes to meet uh, Afroz Shah and you know, asks him. The first question he asks him is, "Why did you do it? That is, uh, you are not a politician, you are not a big official, you are not a corporate person, you know, you are not a municipal or corporation officer, but you are just an ordinary citizen. Why did you do it?" Then his answer is very simple: "If not me, then who? Right? If everybody everybody thinks it is not my problem." right and, and and then passes the buck right uh, the problem will never get done right if not me <laughs> if not me then who is a hallmark of the attitude of a successful person that's the first quality that you see in successful people so let us talk about the qualities of successful people the their first quality is like i said you know they they take that first step forward they not hesitate to take that first step forward they are proactive right proactive behavior means it involves acting in advance of a future future situation rather than acting uh, just reacting to it a lot of people want to be spoon fed through life i mean i i know one friend uh, he you know he visited he lives in us he visited me once in chennai and uh, he had some difficult decisions to make and he found out about some famous astrologers in chennai and uh, he would talk to them and ask them uh, which city should he settle down in and which uh, job he has to take up and whom he should marry and everything all the decisions were given the answers were given by the astrologer and then he went back to satisfactory so thing is uh, of course uh, i mean that's not how you live life even if you try it won't work I mean, it's it's very common sense thing is somebody for a lot of people somebody has to tell them what they have to do and then they unquestioningly accept those answers and do something if it bounces back and gives negative uh, results then they complain but that's how they that's how they live whereas if you look at successful people they take their own decisions if if uh, things don't work out they accept responsibility for the decisions they don't blame others all right whereas some people simply respond to stimuli coming from the environment and uh, you know they react to them and live like that so in fact interestingly uh, or just jokingly there is a disorder there is a brain disorder you know discussed in neuroscience where patients show very similar behavior so french neurologist called francois lehermie 
studied pair patients uh, who were slaves to the sensory world so they just respond to stimuli coming from around and then they they they, they, they keep on acting like that so for example if you put a toothbrush in their hands they'll pick it up and immediately brush their teeth or if you put a comb in their hands they, they comb their hair right or if you give them a vacuum cleaner they go, go immediately go and start vacuuming the entire floor so point is they don't have any will of their own they just respond to stimuli i mean you, you can see a lot of people simply you know although the comparison is uh, somewhat maybe it's not be totally accurate but uh, some people you know you do you'll be working on the computer and suddenly some email comes you open the email and read it or some message comes there's a beep in the mobile in the read mobile and they respond to that mobile or somebody calls them they walk away so point is i mean we, we are at this these days where there is so many distractions around we are also becoming like slaves of the sensory world just like these patients in fact there's even a name for this syndrome it's called environment dependency syndrome so this kind of a disease occurs when there is a damage to a part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex which is the front most frontal most part of the brain whereas if you look at successful people their behavior doesn't look like this so to there's two kinds of functioning the stimulus response behavior where you get a stimulus and respond to it the other kind of function is there is a will inside where all of us have are endowed with this special capacity called conscious will right with this we can make conscientious we can even decide not to act in some situations or even if you want to act you know you can pick and choose among multiple choices and then act according to our you know our uh, Our, our will, right? So this ability to consciously act according to your will, right, is is the hallmark of a good, successful person. So when they act like that, they take hundred percent responsibility of their own future, of their own fate, right? Uh, so my response is my responsibility. So I know I've seen people even middle-aged people constantly complaining about their parents. You know, my father hasn't paid donation for me when I was. Going to this college and had he paid much, you know, donation, I would have gone to a better college. I would have had a better life. This is exactly the talk of a loser, right? Uh, only losers talk like that. So, but so thing is, if you want to be successful, the first mantra is the buck stops with you. The ball is always in your court. You don't have this attitude. You will not be successful. Even any success that you meet will be transient or occasional. It won't be lasting. Okay. So next quality is they don't wait for opportunities. They create them. So let's look at the story of uh, Jana Stanfield. So Jana uh, wanted to be a singer right from her young age, and she took some singing lessons. She had some training. She was singing at some local country club that went on for some years. But she, suddenly, then her ambitions grew, and she wanted to become a lyric writer and a recording artist, and make her own albums and become famous. So she moved to a big city. This is the city of Nashville in the state of Tennessee in U.S. So it's a big Nashville is a big music hub. So she lived for there for some years, trying for a break, and uh, she tried for many years, and that big break never came. So she was uh, quite disappointed, and she met a dead end. I mean, she tried. She was imagining a very long and glorious path, but very quickly she met a dead end. So what do you do when you meet a dead end? You know, do you get depressed or jump off the cliff, or what happens? So so then she remembered this fundamental principle of success, which is that. whatever you want to become you become that inside yourself first it then becomes a reality outside if you want to become a soldier you need to brave first inside and you need to have that psychological and emotional quality only then you can become a good soldier outside i mean just common sense okay? so she said okay i want to become a singer right for that i don't need a formal job and a position and a tag i mean whenever i have chance i'll sing that's a singer a singer is a person who sings that's all so she is and you know, took that kind of an attitude and started singing at every you know, at every uh, opportunity she began to perform perform wherever she can like you know if she goes to some party and somebody asks her to sing she would sing or she would go to schools and sing and motivate children and entertain them or if there is no such audience uh, captive audience she would go to this, go to a street right with a guitar and her electronic keyboard and just start singing right uh, so sorry she also started singing in some churches she also composed some devotional songs and uh, so once when she sang in a church this elderly woman approached her and said jana i like that uh, song that you sang the other day and i was really moved to tears can you please uh, record that song on a cassette tape and give it to me and, and listen to it whenever i have have time 
So Janal said that's a very good uh, response, and then she recorded that song and also in addition a bunch of other songs also, and made lots of copies of you know cassettes, and gave one to this lady and also started selling the other copies. Her husband uh, <coughs> gave a lot of support in these efforts. Slowly she worked her way up like this, and she followed her passion you know quite faithfully, diligently, in a steadfast manner. And after some years, uh, she started two companies, two startups. One is called Keynote Concerts. Uh, this company basically conducts uh, motivation lectures and the music concerts in colleges. Uh, so basically combining music and motivation, it's a, it's a great uh, recipe right, for inspiring people, young people. The other company is Relatively Famous Records, where uh, she remembered her own journey as a young and you know, uh, amateurish, amateur artist uh, struggling to find her feet. So she wanted to give a uh, good life to people who are struggling like her, like what, how she did long ago. So, uh, so, so I think it is the whole theme of uh, I rise and I help others rise. By following certain principles, you can become very successful. You can have a glorious life. And once you get there, you can also help others, right, also are struggling who, like you did, right, also you know, get such, uh, you know, have such a glorious life. Next quality is they're action oriented. They don't sit and talk all day long about all sorts of plans without taking a single step forward. They very uh, quickly graduate from the action and planning stage to, sorry, the, from intention and planning stage to action stage. Let's take the hypothetical example of Ashok and Renu. Both of them are secondary engineering students. They were, they were looking that, that to, this time has come for them to get into some internship. So Renu started preparing her resume and she started you know, giving touch-ups to it and trying to decide on what kind of font would be ideal, what kind of font size and what kind of indentation and colors and underlines, etc., etc. And that went on and on for several weeks. In the meantime, Ashok uh, quickly put together some rough resume and started sending it out to companies right, and started finding contacts of the senior uh, students in the college and to their contacts. They could reach other contacts in the industry. And within a couple of weeks, he was able to land an internship and Renu is still giving touch ups to her resume. So point is, you see that if you want success, you need to quickly get into action, right, from this uh, intentional planning stage. So when you talk about action, right, action, it immediately begs the question of the field of action. Where do you act and where do you not act, All right? So here people talk about uh, two circles. Several others have talked about this. Stephen Covey in his uh, famous book talks about it. I'll mention some of these books later. So th this author talks about two circles. What are these circles? One is the circle of concern, other is the circle of influence. Let's take the example of COVID. Right? Every day in the news, you see uh, lots of bad things happening all over the world, and you feel bad for it. You know, uh, you feel bad how people are dying or people are falling sick all the time, and so you have concern for them. Yes, so your circle of concern is the entire world. <coughs> but the point is, there's nothing much you can do about it. If something is happening in France or Germany or US or Brazil, I mean, what can we, you know, you and me do about it sitting here in India? But there is a circle of influence where you can do something about it if there's a problem. That influence, for example, for all of us, it's definitely our family. Right? In the family, if somebody is sick, you can attend to them, make sure they are properly, you know quarantined or they're taken care of and uh, you know they're giving, getting the right medication or they're following social distancing or you know sanitizing and all that stuff so there if you do something it will have an effect there will be an impact so that's your circle of influence so successful people quickly analyze and realize uh, what their circle of influence is and concentrate all their energies and efforts in that area they don't deal with the circle of concern because they know that they won't have they won't have an impact there, and so there's no point wasting energy there. So let me explain, kind of illustrate this using a slightly funny example. So this couple, uh, you know, got some best couple award. You know, somebody gave them some kind of a best couple award. So this reporter uh, was very curious. You know, there was interviewing all these best couples, the people who got this best couple award, and to find out what are the secrets of their uh, conjugal harmony. So he comes and asks him, what's your secret? How did you achieve it? So wife you know, first takes the mic and starts explaining. My husband and I have learned very clearly, very early on in our, in our marital life, to clearly separate our domains of action. 
so so therefore i don't stick my finger in his domain and vice versa and he was surprised remote reporter was surprised what are those domains how is it even possible because he sees apples fighting all the time right I mean, which tv to buy and which uh, i don't know what kind of uh, cooker to buy for the kitchen and what kind of carpet what kind of window curtains there is a big fight for everything so how can you segregate your domain so nicely so then the wife explains when it comes to what to buy for home you know what to buy for kitchen uh, where the schools kids what what schools the kids should go to uh, what tuition the kids should go to etc etc i make the decisions plus the interview is even more surprised and what what does your husband do what is his domain then she laughs and says my husband takes care of america's uh, foreign policy india's economic strategies the china australia trade, trade problem etc etc so we never have any conflict of decision so she she smiles and explains, explains. so point is basically in this joke the husband is kind of you know good for nothing and he just has ideas and opinions about everything under the sun right in the airs of opinions freely but in his own personal life is is good for nothing so point is that's where that's what happens if you don't focus on your circle of influence and focus on your circle of concern so if you look at successful people they always concentrate their efforts on the circle of influence okay so then we said uh, we said we need to have a goal and we need to you know we need to identify the circle of influence and the thing is uh, it's not easy to identify a goal very often as a young individual i mean i was very confused when i finished my btech i didn't know what i wanted to do i had a vague idea that's all right so that's the situation with a lot of uh, people you know, young people right and uh, so when that is the case then you can try many paths right consciously relentlessly that right? and once you found your uh, you know found your real thing real passion then follow it you know relentlessly so let me give an example of uh, supriya paul right uh, so she like a lot of young individuals you know right of her age after plus 2 she didn't know what to do initially she thought she'll do biology but right? after a week she changed her mind she said uh, i'll do economics after another week she said she'll do commerce and the parents were very upset what is it you know supriya you can't make up your mind so she took bcom and she uh, right and uh, then she finished bcom and after that again the discussion started at home she didn't know what to do and normally people would do a lot of people would do ca chartered accountancy after bcom so parents suggested that but she was not sure if that's her that's what is to her liking right then uh, so parents this time were really wild because they have been facing their daughters uh, you know a uh, indecisive nature for a long time and they really they broke up so she was also very upset and <laughs> there was a big scene at home then she had an idea she said look uh, a lot of kids like you know young people like her are very confused about their careers so why not organize a meeting i invite all these confused people right and also invite people who are not confused anymore and who have found their feet who have found their goal right found their passion so let these people who are not confused come and give talks to those who are confused right let them share their experiences and then she organized a conference like that uh, so the all these people who have you know done well in their lives they came and gave talks and people who attended that conference like literally, literally miracles happened in their lives so they said you know people who attended after the conference they said oh supriya we really loved your conference uh, you know I have always wanted to didn't like my job, and so after attending this, I say I resigned my job and took up a new position which I always wanted to do. Or somebody said I was, you know, not clear until then, but after your conference, I you know started a startup, or I took up this job which I was hesitating until then. So like there were a lot of good things happened to people who came to that conference, and Supriya so saw all that positive energy, and she said, uh, why not make this a regular affair? And so she started a company that that just does that. right it's called josh talks so josh is you know motivation for inspiration so th- this became a big hit and you know she keeps having these uh, very wonderful meetings another example like that right is uh, dan brown is an I- I mean, american author you might have read some of his novels or at least uh, seen the movie da vinci code so another movie also called angels and demons so uh Dan Brown was his books have been translated into some languages and sold over 200 million. Let's imagine that's about 20 crores. All right, so that's I mean it's a super duper success and as a writer. But when he began his journey, he didn't begin as a writer. 
So he began his journey as a, as you know, he was making children's music and making records and selling them. He had started a company called Dalliance. That uh, was not a big success. So then he moved to Hollywood, uh, at Los Angeles, and uh, he wanted to become a singer and a lyric writer. And, uh, so he tried again for many years, and it's a very tough uh, world. There's a lot of competition, so not much luck again. So then he got sick of this whole music business, and uh, so one day he and his wife took a vacation to some nice uh, beach uh, beach resort. So there he was sitting there on the beach side reading this exciting thriller by Sidney Sheldon called the Doomsday Conspiracy. So as I was reading that, enjoying that you know pleasant surroundings, he had an inspiration. Why not write novels like this, thrillers, right, which can keep you on the edge of your seat, right, and entertain, entertain readers. So he had that idea, and that's when he started you know, writing novels. He did a whole unique path of his own, you know, uh, and became very successful. The thing is, what your first job or first occupation may not, may not be the last one, but you need to keep trying, searching for that ideal occupation, best occupation for you. Then, next quality is they are constant learners. So when you talk about learning, uh, let's divide that learning into motivational and informational. Both are important. You can learn from books or in you know, courses, online, offline, internships. But it's these days, it's, even, it's easy to even have international internships. You can go to best places all over the world, you know, or nationally or all over the world. Attend lectures, you know, meet people, successful people, and interview them, talk to them. So one trick, uh, some, you know, one other right says, if you want to meet a successful person, write to them, you know, say that I want to take you for lunch, write to a very good place, right? And then if they accept that, you can spend one hour with them or whatever. And then learn about all their secrets. You know, it's, it's an interesting idea. So there's a lot of resources on internet, right, on Wiki. Not WhatsApp is not a great source of knowledge, but lots of resources of knowledge on, on internet. Knowledge is very precious in the current century, particularly because of the nature of the economy that we are seeing in the 21st century. Because until 19th century, or even the first half of 20th, 20th century, we had an industrialized economy. That is, machines were most important, most critical for the economy. <laughs> If you had great missions, you will have great productivity and therefore you will have you know, wealth and so on and so forth. But in, in the second half of the 20th century, right, we started, you know, it ushered in the era of uh, knowledge economy. Right, in this new economy, knowledge is the most precious thing. That's why people, corporate people are, right, uh, are so careful about their uh, intellectual property, IP. Right, that's more, more important than you know, gold and silver and platinum. So therefore, by corollary, uh, those who know become valuable. So the more you know, the more valuable you will be. So I just want to uh, quote uh, Peter Drucker, who is considered the father of modern management theory on this. He says, in the future, there will be no poor countries. There will only be ignorant countries. But if a country is ignorant, if people of a country are ignorant, then the, so the society will be poor. So the ignorance and poverty go hand in hand. So uh, if you want to look at titles on motivation leadership, there are lots of hundreds of titles. In my own personal collection, I have about at least two, three hundred titles. Uh, I'll just mention a few important ones. Jack Canfield, uh, The Success Principles. So Canfield has taken uh, principles from many, many resources and uh, you know, put together some kind of a manual of success. It's a great book uh, to have. Uh, you can. Buy it yourself, for you know, you can order it for your college. It's a, it's a great book to look at. And uh, then Stephen Covey, it's a very, it's an old book, very successful. It's uh, you know, especially influential in the management uh, uh, departments all over the world. It's called the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He doesn't use the word successful people; he calls them effective people. Effective people are those who can translate their ideas and will into action and then get things done. They're effective. And he doesn't say seven principles of success. He says habits. So these people follow those principles habitually, as if it's their second nature. You don't, they don't have to consciously try and tell themselves, OK, let me use this principle and then act like this and speak like this. No. They can do this effortlessly because they've been doing it for, for such a long time. So this book is very successful. It's uh, 30 million copies of this book, book were sold. Is one title. It's written many other books, uh, more like derivative books on these lines. Uh, but and it's also translated into many world languages. 
Rashmi Bansal. Rashmi is a IIM graduate. Uh, as we, she's been writing excellent books on lots of uh, you know, very successful entrepreneurs in India. The people who started uh, companies and you know startups or NGOs, right? And the people who came from very difficult life situations, pulled themselves out of that situation and then you know made it very big in some area. It's a very inspiring uh, line of books, and this is one example. Uh, the Supriya, Supriya Paul, with whom story, whose story we just mentioned, also wrote a book, edited a book called All You Need Is George, which is quite true. Actually, in our education system, we often focus on information and cram you know, you know, students with information. Whereas if we just give a little dose of motivation, inspiration, information, you know, students can always pick up on their own for the big part. Right, but what is really needed is motivation or Josh. Or oh, this book, Powerful by Nirpama Suramanian. She talks about how women can tap their inner potential. I mean, women, we, we adore women as Shakti in India, right? So, how do you tap that Shakti that, that's there innate in women? So, this is a very nice book uh, uh, because you see lots of uh, women in top position these days, and women are really you know, doing very well these days in India. And so, how do, how do they, how are they doing it? It's a book about that. Now I just noticed that uh, CMS, uh, you know, college uh, system has also a program on hotel management. Now I've read about a little bit about uh, Ritz Carlton Hotel and how what kind of management principles they, they follow. It's a it's a luxury hotel, as some of you might have heard about them. All right, and what what are the success principles? What are the leadership principles? So it's a very nice book on that. You can take a look at that. So like that, there's a ocean of literature on leadership and motivation. If you're interested, I can send you a long list of titles. So again, uh, since a lot of the audience come from math and biology, I'll give some popular science titles in that, and generally in science. Right? So there's a book which uh, is very influential. Uh, this is, you know, Carl Sagan is a famous uh, uh, science popularizer and astrophysicist. So he's written a, this influential book called Cosmos. It was also meant a TV series in the 80s. When this TV series came in the 80s, apparently, Something like 500 million people, that's half a billion people, have watched this TV series all over the world. It's such an influential series. Uh, it has also come in book form. I've translated this into Telugu a few years ago. But I found this book uh, you know, very interesting, very inspiring. So if you take some titles in, in mathematics. So when I was uh, small in my high school days, you know, there used to be this, uh, a lot of Russian books used to be available from mere publishers. I mean, of course, English translations of that. They were very uh, of low cost, uh, they were very cheap. That's where they were quite affordable. So I used to buy these books, a lot of these books, and used to read them. One such book in maths is Straight Lines and Curves. It's a story of curves, very famous curves, remarkable curves. Uh, like what, is a, what is a track tricks, right? What is an, as an asteroid? What is a stainless curve, right? And, and ellipses and circles and their properties. And it's a very exciting book. If you read this book, you'll fall in love with geometry. The same way publishers has a whole series called Little, you know, Little Mathematics Library, and where they take some maths topic, and in each book, it's a very tiny book, each book will be about 30, 40 pages, not more than that. Uh, they cover one topic, and uh, this, this the publisher is, is no more, I mean, the, the publishing houses closed, shut down. But there are lots of PDFs available on the internet, and it's, it's really it's a, a treasure trove of literature. Then one book which uh, which I read in during my I think formative years in my college years is in the search for beauty uh, unraveling uh, non Euclidean geometry by Smilga. So this is a, this is a story of what is called the fifth postulate in Euclid's uh, geometry. So people were so the fifth postulate is a parallel lines the, you know, postulate that is when you, the two parallel lines if a third line cuts it and cuts them like a transversal the interior angles are the same. This is something every kid knows even at high school level or even at uh, middle school level. But point is, for a long time, people are not sure whether it's a postulate or a theorem. For a long time, people are it's a, it's a theorem which can derived from previous axioms. But only after a lot of struggle, after centuries of uh, struggle, people have realized that it's actually an axiom. That need not be always true. There can be other possibilities. And depending upon the other possibilities, you will have either Euclidean geometry or Lobachevskian geometry or Riemannian geometry. And these are the considerations which uh, have seriously influenced, influenced Einstein's uh, general relativity much later, you know, centuries later. 
so this author explains that whole history of the evolution of these ideas in such a beautiful way, such a beautiful language. I mean, it's a brilliant book. Uh, and more recently, uh, Mladino, Leonard Mladino also has written a book called Euclid's Window. And it's also a story of geometry. And he covers a lot of these ideas, again, this parallel postulate and all that. Uh, written in a very simple, easy style. And you know, if you can get these books, uh, see if you can you know, get hold of them. There's another book called Math Book. It's a very colorful book, again, a popular science book. See, I've noticed that uh, because I've been noticing Indian uh, popular science literature, Indian Indian languages to some extent, at least in Telugu, Tamil, and Hindi. Right? And there's not a whole lot, especially in popular maths, if you look at the kind of books available in our Indian languages. Mostly it is books on some fancy arithmetic or Vedic mathematics and things like that. Uh, but uh, if you look at popular maths in English, there's an ocean of it. Like this is a very nice book, which covers the history of mathematics uh, you know, in 250 pages or 250 colorful short articles. Then uh, Martin Gardner, you know, you should uh, look up his work. Maybe your college has college library has some of his books. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> He's written lots of books, uh, you know, very entertaining stuff, and you can get hold of some. There should be some PDFs floating around, right? And take a look at them. Then in engineering, again, there is, again, tons of stuff. Uh, so recently I came across this book, very brilliant book called Built, The Hidden Stories Behind Our Structures by Roma Agrawal. So Roma Agrawal, as you can see, that she's an Indian uh, origin girl uh, or woman who settled in UK and is a <clears throat> famous structural engineer. So the, she, she, was, she was on the design team of this famous uh, London structure called the Shard. The Shard means, you know, that is a piece of glass. This famous building, uh, which looks like a huge piece of glass, which is considered the tallest building in the Western Europe. So she was on the design, the design team. So she's written this book, uh, which is about, she talks about famous structures in the world and their design principles, their secrets and all that. But what is nice about this book is she weaves her own personal story into the narrative and makes it really enjoyable and, uh, and fun to read. So for example, she talks about how she fell in love with her future husband and so apparently, she, she met this guy, you know, in a party, and that guy tried to, you know, he kept trying to talk to her, and she was trying to avoid him in the, in the beginning. Then he, he starts sending her emails, and normally it's a, it's a very unusual kind of emails. In every email, he would explain to her the something about some famous structure in the world, some bridge or some building or something. The email is about structures, and uh, so she found it very funny. And so after some time, they fall, fell in love and. So point is, that with these kinds of interesting anecdotes, she makes the book highly readable, and it's really enjoyable. Another book on similar lines called Structures or Why Things Don't Fall Down, Don't Fall Down, by J. E. Gordon. Uh, there are not many popular science books on structures, to my knowledge. Uh, this is one of them. And some somebody gave this book to me about 10 years ago. And when I read this, I, I was really cursing myself. Why didn't people show me this book when I was in high school? I would have taken civil engineering, right? Not electrical engineering, because so th the point is in India, you know, we take our branch based on some kind of this thing called rank that we get in a very mechanical fashion. But point is, every field is exciting. So many things are happening in every field. It depends on how you get introduced to that field, right? So these books really introduce you, you know, to, to the glories of that field and they make it very exciting. Or this book on material science called Stuff: The Materials the World Is Made Of. Or since a lot of students are from biology in this audience, I'll mention a few titles from biology. So this book by James Watson was, you know, Watson and Crick, right? They got Nobel Prize for their uh, you know, discovery of the DNA structure. So DNA, uh, this book by Watson is brilliant. It's a very, it has a nice flow to it. Uh, it's unputdownable. I mean, I started reading it once when I was visiting IIT Roorkee and in the library I saw this book. I just sat down there and finished most of the book. Uh, then this book, uh, The Rainbow and the Worm by May Van Ho. <clears throat> so Ho is a, I think she's a biotechnologist based in UK, I think, but she's originally from Hong Kong. This book, it's such a brilliant book on, you know, how to look at the biological systems from physics point of view, especially from statistical mechanics point of view. And she makes it so exciting, this you know, field of biology, and she combines how biology and physics, and it's a wonderful book, book to read. Of Siddhartha Mukherjee's, uh, you know, Emperor of All Melodies, you know that, you know, he got Pulitzer Prize 
I haven't read this book, but you know, it's a very acclaimed book and see if you can get, get hold of this. Indians are doing brilliantly in popular science these days. Uh, this is a you know, Indian origin writer based in UK again, called Manjit Kumar, has written this classic called Quantum. He describes the stories of uh, you know, the pioneers of quantum theory in this book. Uh, so this, a lot of quantum theory work was done in the first half of 20th century, as you know. And it was done in a very difficult uh, you know, social context. And two world wars occurred in that same period. And these guys were, you know, in, in Europe, people were, uh, you know, people were literally fleeing their countries, fleeing their homes, just, you know, for their lives. And, uh, you know, going from city to city, running from city to city. In such a difficult uh, social background, these guys were sitting and discussing about the nature of the atom, right, and writing equations and building, you know, theories. So, so that is passion. I mean, that's really daredevilry. Uh, the kind of daredevils that you see in, you know, by, in, among the eminent scientists. There's a great reading, you know, see if you can get hold of this. Similarly, T. Padmanavan, they call him fondly Paddy, uh, who's uh, you know, actually sadly passed away recently. So he's written lots of science, popular science, <clears throat> written this cartoon book of uh, physics called Surya Physics. It's been translated in many languages. I've done it in Telugu. Uh, see if you can get hold of this. It covers the story of physics from the early man to string theory. It's a brilliant writing. Or this book called Empires of Light. Uh, so it's a story of electrical engineering and right? how electrical engineering revolutionized the world, right? And uh, this is a book by Michio Kaku. Michio Kaku, Kaku is, just a, is a theoretical physicist, he's a string theorist. But he wrote this book on neuroscience, which is just simply brilliant, right? It's, it's great how a physicist can write such a wonderful book on brain. So uh, now you can read my book. Uh, I've written, I published this book about a couple of years ago. Uh, it's, it, it tries to present the modern computational perspective of brain, a language which a biologist can understand without much knowledge of mathematics. Right? It's published by Springer. So uh, or uh, see this book by Steve Stephen Vogel. Right? Stephen Vogel has written extensively on on biology, a popular popular biology. And this book combines biology and engineering. It talks about how biological systems have inspired engineering design. Okay, so lots of literature and see you know, if you can sample some of that. Then there's successful people are risk takers, right? So usually we work in some kind of a comfort zone, right? And uh, we don't like to get out of the comfort zone because comfort, getting out of comfort zone means looking like idiots. Because you're getting into a field where you are ignorant, you don't know things. So others might laugh at you if you do something there, right? But this is exactly what one has to do if you want to achieve great success. Take risk and get out of the comfort zone. So one example, one story of that is the story of Jeff Ark. So Jeff was a school teacher. He was uh, teaching karate to school kids. So as you can imagine, that that's not a very challenging job, and he was getting bored with his job. It was uh, you know getting dull. So I started listening to this uh, motivational tapes by a speaker called Anthony Robbins or Tony Robbins. So in these tapes, uh, Tony keeps saying that, you know, you have to dream bigger, right? In life, you should never settle down at one level for a long time. You should always try to go to the next level. So then this guy started thinking about it. What can I do? How can I go to the next level? So this guy always wanted to write a script for a movie. And uh, so he writes a script for a movie called Sleepless in Seattle. Then he wrote that and showed the script around to some people to ask their opinion. And most people discouraged it because it's a, they said it's a silly story because in the story, the hero and heroine don't meet each other until almost to the end of the movie. All right? And uh, they said, they tell him that, look, you know, a lot of people in movies, hero and heroine meet and work together and sing songs together all through and still they go flop. Right? Uh, in this movie, it's so weird. They don't even meet and you know, it's not, not like it won't fly. But Jeff took risk, and uh, after a bit of search, he was able to sell his uh, screenplay for uh, forty million dollars. And the movie was made, and it became a super hit. Uh, the, so the main lead actors, Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan, it, it really catapulted them into great fame after that. And uh, Jeff himself has got Oscar nomination for screenplay. So that's what happens if you decide and dare to step out of the comfort zone and try something new and follow your passion. So they learn from mistakes. That is, if you the moment you try something different or you know follow a passion, doesn't mean everything is 
going to work out you know, very well and everything will be hunky dory. No, there will be failures. <coughs> but point is, what will you do with that failure? Are you going to be dejected and stop, you know, quit your efforts completely, or will you learn from that feedback, do a course correction, and go forward? So then they walk the extra mile. They, this walking of extra mile is a quality that is emphasized a lot by an author called Napoleon Hill. Napoleon Hill has written very lots of influential books. His most popular book is something called Think and Grow Rich. Basically, it puts it a bit, you know, kind of paradoxically. It's, he says, you can just think and become rich. You, know, it's, you need to read the book, how you can th think and you know, become rich. So another book, he gives us interesting uh, illustration on the importance of uh, walking the extra mile. So there was this shopping mall right in Pittsburgh in, in US. Uh, so one day, uh, this elderly woman walks into the shopping mall. And at, the, at that time, there, was, there were not many customers in the shop. And uh, all the salesmen were sitting in a corner and chit-chatting. So nobody attends to her. And attend, and attends to her. And you see that also very often in shops here, right? I mean, when you walk in, nobody comes to you and all that. Whereas, so among these salesmen, one salesman, salesman saw and sees her, right? And uh, approaches her and says, you know, ma'am, what can I do for you? And what do you want to see? What can I show for you? So then she says, no, 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 I didn't come to buy anything. Don't bother. I just it was raining outside. So I thought I'll just take shelter here for some time. As soon as the rain subsides, I'll, I'll go away and don't worry. But she says, that's fine, ma'am. You can you know, have a seat. And she, he offers her a seat. And he says, you know, can I get you something hot to drink, etc." She says, no, no, don't worry about me. I'll just sit by myself. Salesman goes away and forgets about that incident. So after a couple of weeks, he gets the letter in his mailbox. It's an offer letter to, to a big job, right? Uh, so apparently the same shopping mall, like they are opening a branch in Scotland, and he, they wanted him to become the head of the head of that shopping mall. So he was quite shocked because he doesn't he, he didn't apply for any job like that and doesn't know any big people and uh, he was a right. So how did how did who who even found him discovered him? So what happened was the lady who came to the shop that, that day, uh, it turns out that she is the mother of a famous industrialist called Andrew Carnegie, who's an American billionaire. I mean, you're talking about uh, late 19th century. So that, that, as a billionaire, was a very big deal at that time. So she saw a good quality in this person, the, the ability to go out of your comfort zone and walk that extra mile, do something more than what you are officially required to do. Right, and uh, so therefore, that's the kind of thing that you need to make it big to make things work. So he, she recommended this boy to her, uh, to her son, and uh, he made this job offer. So they say again, they are not rejected by rejection. I think we have seen this uh, quality already. So the story of Chinu Kala. So Chinu Kala was, uh, you know, like a young individual uh, somewhere in North India. And uh, she had an argument with her home, with her parents once, and because parents were upset that she's not doing anything with her, with her life, she's indecisive and all that. So she had a fight at home and she walks away uh, with a, just a you know, handbag and uh, she didn't have much money, she just had 300 rupees with her. She, she walked away in a, in, in a fit, but she didn't know what to do with her life. Uh, so somebody meets her and says, look, you know, can you do some door-to-door -door, door -door sales? And make some money. I mean, that can be your livelihood. She agrees and then picks up these products and goes to the first home and knocks on the door. And a lady opens the door and she, this girl starts explaining about her products. Immediately, that woman slams the door on her face. All right. So she was really shocked and you know, crestfallen because that kind of a treatment she never received anywhere. She was a very, you know, she was a pampered child and all that. And, but so she really wanted to quit everything and go back home. But then her pride came in the way. So she she decided to go you know, go forward. So like that, she marches on and you know grows from kind of, kind of peak to peak. And finally, just a few years ago, she starts a 15 crore business in jewelry and starts a big shop in a Bangalore shopping mall. Right, and she talks about all this in her in an interview. So point is, rejections are very common when you, whenever you try something, but don't let them stop you. So even more classic case, a dramatic case is a British writer 
called John Creasy. So this guy received 743 rejection slips before he published his first book. And over 40 years, he wrote uh, 600 books, right? In, in, a, in many different uh, pseudonyms. And the story of Monty Roberts is even more interesting. This man, when he was a small boy, in a like, small child, uh, had interesting, a bitter experience. So his, his teacher in his class, he, they, his teacher asked him, them to write an essay on what they will become, they want to become when they, when they grow up. This little boy wrote that when I grow up, I'll acquire a big ranch of 200 acres. I'll groom race horses in that and sell them and become a millionaire. That's how precise and how detailed his, his dream was. And the student link, the teacher didn't like the article uh, and he gives him an F grade, he fails it. So the boy was uh, you know, very disappointed, he felt sad. So then the teacher asks him, calls him back and says, look, if you agree to write, rewrite your article in a more realistic fashion, because this boy comes from a very poor background. So the teacher thought it's very un unreasonable or unrealistic. So he says, now if you write, rewrite your essay in more realistic fashion, I'll, I'll pass you. And what the boy said is quite remarkable. He said, I'm keeping my dream. You can keep your effort. I don't want to rewrite your stupid essay. Uh, no, I mean, I want my dream is more important to me. And that boy really grows up and realizes his dream. He right, acquires some 150 acres of land and starts his farm. It's called Flaggies of Farms, where he grooms racehorses and you know becomes very rich. So dreams are quite precious, you know, don't don't give them up because some idiot said something. Uh, so they're not rejected by rejection, right? So this uh, actor, Sylvester Stallone, you might have seen some of his movies, actor, writer, and director. He actually has a really interesting take on uh, dejection. He says if somebody rejects him, or, you know, he gets even more inspired by, by that. He says, if I take rejection as somebody blowing a bugle in my ear, to wake me up and get going rather than retreat. So that's also, you can also do that. So finally, they pursue their goal for long years. That, that is, you, you have picked up a goal, right? And you have, uh, you know, you have overcome rejections and setbacks and all that. But your results may not come overnight. You need to stay with your goal and your path for a long time. How long is the question? So it's an interesting question, right? You know, but uh, this writer called Malcolm Gladwell has was, was written very many popular and impactful books. He has studied lives of many successful people and arrives at, at this magic figure called 10,000 Hours. He says that people who have become real top-notch experts at their, whatever they're doing, would have invested uh, something like 10,000 hours of effort and practice in that area. So to give an example, we may or may not take that number seriously, but you will see that people have stuck with that line of work for years before they become real masters at that work. <clears throat> Let's look at the story of Anand Negi. So Anand Negi was working in Himachal Pradesh state government in a desert development program. So the objective of this program is to convert a lot of you know, desert land into, into green land. <coughs> Just a second. So since about 1999, he and a bunch of his colleagues began to visit this place called Kinnor in Himachal Pradesh. After several years of work with that department, he said, you know, nothing is not going very, very far, not very, going very fast. Because he noticed that in government uh, departments, yeah, you know, you, you keep seeing money getting squandered, but there's no outcome. <clears throat> so he quits his job, moves completely to Kinnar, and there he starts working directly on, on the project. And he also gets help from a bunch of locals. And together, this small group of very motivated people they completely transform 90 hectares of mountainous desert land into green land by planting uh, 30,000 trees over a few years. So he is called the desert healer. I mean, healed the whole desert land. land. So another example of like that is uh, the spelling bee competition. So there's this competition which is popular in US called the spelling bee. So where the kids, students are asked uh, English words and that they should tell the spelling. You know, English spelling is a bit tricky, unlike Indian languages. 
uh, english spelling is very counter intuitive so it's uh, difficult to memorize spellings so uh, so english vocab is about as i think million words uh, huge so uh, it's quite challenging to remember lots of words and apparently indian students or students of indian families in us you know they have the reputation that they do very well in this competition typically so this writer called angela duckworth she interviewed lots of successful students you know in this competition and asked them how did you do it right and what she learned from these interviews is that the real, real secret is deliberate practice deliberate in the sense voluntary practice they are not doing it just because some parent is sitting on their head forcing them to do it they themselves like this competition they wanted to win right and they have the passionate about it and then they put in that kind of a loving practice and typically the practice involves thousands of hours of practice so what uh, angela duckworth has concluded from not only this student but lots of other examples he said what it takes to succeed in in life the right or whatever you have taken up is grit right it's not iq it's not intelligence intelligence it's not uh, you know social support you know it's not a family background all that so nothing nothing else matters one thing that distinguishes successful people is grit the ability to stay on course for a long time right until you achieve whatever you want to achieve okay so let us uh, take a small uh, two minute break and uh, we continue with this uh, session just 2 minutes thanks <coughs> the program will continue okay <clears throat> so let's continue so until now we talked about individual qualities of successful people so what are the qualities that they should have themselves but thing is if you want to achieve success you cannot achieve it you know, all alone all by yourself you have to work with others and only then as a group you can achieve success so how do you work with others who are these those others and how do you work with them so when we talk about others i'll i'll categorize them into three different categories the others who are more senior to you uh, wiser and competent more accomplished than you then the others who are at your at the same level as you then others who are more junior to you younger than you so then let's look at the first category of <coughs> those who are <coughs> sorry wiser and more competent than you and we need to have somebody from this category as a mentor it's good to always have some some mentor everybody should have a mentor ideally speaking and who is uh, so so suppose you want to become good at some let's say some sport right your mentor should be somebody who's already accomplished you know in that sport and so on and there should be ideal relationship between the mentor and the disciple or the student right uh, the mentor should have concern for you and you should admire and trust that that mentor a classic example of that kind of a relationship is sri ram krishna and swami vivekananda in the spiritual world but in sports you can take the example of gopi chand and sindhu right but whatever it is it's good to search for a mentor and also thing is when when you approach a mentor for advice or in a counsel <clears throat> they also look for some qualities in the student that is they because they value their time and they don't like people wasting their time so they might uh, see if you know, if, if, if you are given advice will you follow it will you implement it or will you just you know waste their time with idle discussions right so 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 it's a, it's a mutual thing but if if it if you mentor and a student are right for each other right then there can be a lot of progress and the second category of people is um, what is called a master mind group there are a lot of writers who use this term master mind group <clears throat> so basically this is a set of like minded people 
with shared goals, shared dreams, and where they they are all like some kind of a friends group, and they like each other, they appreciate each other, and they support each other, motivate each other. This this group could could uh, nucleate from a bunch of friends from college. But after that, they keep in touch and they meet once in a while or constantly talk to each other and help each other, motivate each other, like a strong network of friends. And in that group, try to avoid the you know people who are very pessimistic and negative about everything. Right, nothing is going to change. The kind of people, right, leave them out of such uh, such groups. So I want to quote Helen Keller: uh, "Alone we can do so little; together we can do so much." So a great example of mastermind group is the those who the founders of Infosys. There are seven of them, right? You can see them in this picture. You can recognize immediately uh, Narayan Murthy and young Narayan Murthy and uh, young Chris Gopal Krishna. So initially, they joined. They started their journey as uh, you know in a company called Patni, and they were all colleagues in that company. Then they wanted to have their own company, and then they got out of Patni and starting forces. In the beginning, I think they you know they started their office in Narayan Murthy's house, and uh, and then slowly you know from there they you know, they they evolved into this giant multinational or Infosys. So that's one example of you know, what kind of wonders. A mastermind group can achieve. Another example, you know, more from a from, from the example of a bunch of high school students, uh, is this uh, story of uh, Rocket Boys. This is actually a, a true story, right? And this happened in 1958. So in that year, uh, Russia launched the first artificial satellite called Sputnik, and it was a big wonder. It made news all over the world. Because for the first time, they were able to place a man-made object in the sky, in orbiting around the Earth. And what is special about Sputnik is that uh, its solar panels were arranged in such a fashion that they reflect sunlight, and then therefore the satellite itself can be seen from the Earth as a small, moving, shining dot. Like it looks, it looks like a moving, moving star. So from all over the world, people were watching this um, moving star. This man-made wonder, right? You could see it in the night sky. So in the US also, people were watching it. And uh, so there's a small village called Colwood in the state of West Virginia. So uh, it's a really backward village. There was a coal mine there, and there's nothing else. And uh, one night, uh, the villagers came out of their houses, and they were looking for this wonder. And a bunch of five school kids also were looking at the same event. So villagers were getting scared seeing that thing because they thought they were wondering if you know, Russia will make bombs and throw bombs on US right with this new technology. Whereas the kids had a very different response. One of those children, uh, boy's name is Homer. He said, "Okay, let's also make a rocket." Right, that's his response. So the thing is, it's a very backward village and nobody knew what a rocket is. And uh, the American uh, space program, NASA was. In a very nascent stage at that, at that time, so, uh, so they didn't know how to make a rocket. So these guys start wondering how to go about it. So then they decide to write to a scientist uh, called Werner von Braun uh, to help them make a rocket. And scientist was quite moved by that by that letter and sent some material. So these boys try to make something at home and and, and light it and emit it. It blows up, and fortunately nobody is uh, you know, hurt in that process. But so the thing is, whole movie is about a series of failed and explosive experiments that these kids uh, perform. And towards the end of the movie, the, the their experiment succeeds. They are able to make a rocket, which goes a few kilometers <clears throat> into the sky. <clears throat> and that uh, project gets a first prize at a national science fair. So, so the whole movie is about a science experiment. It's a really brilliant movie. I watched it many many times. It's, Every time I find it quite inspiring. So you see if you can get all of this moment. So next quality, next category of people is those who are junior to you, a team. So the thing is, it, it, no matter you know, you don't have to be a manager to be able to lead a team, right? No matter what your job is, very often you end up leading a team. You could be a teacher, a class teacher. You'll be leading the te in a team of class students. You could be a HOD. You'll be leading a team of lecturers. Right, uh, it could be, uh, it could be a, a prime minister leading a whole team of a whole nation, right? So everybody should knows how what it means to lead a team and be a leader. 
Okay, so uh, lots of uh, literature on team team building and all that. But if you want to learn it from a movie, so you see the movie Lagan, right? And uh, this movie, as you know, it's a fictitious story, but still, it's a story set in the in British India, right? Where this boy, a young man, leads a team of uh, cricket players from a who are a bunch of villages so who are not even educated, right? And and makes them win against a British uh, cricket team, right? So apparently, I heard that this movie is screened in some IIMs as an example of a great team building exercise. But if you want to read more formal literature on team building and leadership, uh, read the work of John Maxwell. He's a popular sign, popular uh, speaker on leadership, one of the best uh, in this subject. Uh, lots of YouTube videos and lots of books. I have a uh, lots of the titles by this author. Uh, these two are you know, somewhat short, and see if you can get hold of them and read them. He talks about lots of you know, laws of leadership, and then you know, I won't go into that. It's a bit too technical for this talk, but if that book is very, you know, is very readable. See if you can re get hold of it. So until now, we just talked about only career and you know, and, and the individual care qualities and you know, team qualities and all that. But life is not just all career, right? What you do when you come back home from your workplace is also equally important. You want to have a healthy and you know, fulfilling life. So to, to illustrate that, you know, some others give this example. There's this guy who is trying to cut a piece of log, right, using this using this saw, and he's been at it uh, for a for quite a long time, and this saw the teeth of this saw is completely blunt blunted, and but he still is going on and on with that with that activity. So somebody sees him and says, uh, "Look, uh, your saw is completely blunt, right? Therefore, your work is going so slow. Why don't you take off a little bit, right? Sharpen the saw and come back and continue your work." And the guy says, "No, no, no. I'm very busy and I'm already late. So if I take a break now, I'll take it. It'll take even longer. So I'll keep and go on like this." So this is exactly what a lot of us do, right? In our eagerness to do well in our jobs, right? Uh, we we forget to sharpen our saw. That is, sharpen the saw of our instrument. Our instrument is our body, mind, and spirit. So unless you relax appropriately and sharpen this saw, keep it in tune, right, like a well-tuned musical instrument, the efficiency goes down, right, and work quality goes down, right. So, so, so that's the reason when you come back from workplace, right, you need to figure out how to relax properly, relax deeply, right. And you know you can spend time with family. You can do meditation or yoga or sports or trekking, whatever. A lot of speakers are talking about work-life balance, which is extremely important. If you want to have a great career, figure out how to have a great relaxation also. So family is very important. You know, this is some people you see complaining that the family is coming in the way of their career. Actually, it's a it's a wrong notion, right? If you if you have a great family, that will be an excellent foundation for your career. Because family is like a is like a fortress from which you can fight the battles of life, right? In a family, if everybody supports, nurtures each other, each other's dreams, and motivates them on their own path, right? Uh, you know, it, it can be a wonderful foundation for your career. Let me give an example, like a hypothetical example. So, in a family, the husband is an engineer, right? And he wants everybody to become engineers, but wife wants to be a writer. She writes, I and mean, she wrote very. Lots of successful books, but husband doesn't believe in that. He thinks that hey, what's the point in writing these stupid books? Why don't you become an engineer or something like that? So there's a lot of friction between husband and wife. Or the daughter uh, wants to be a doctor because she's, she's very empathic and right. She wants to treat people, heal people, and all that. But father thinks you know it's uh, medicine is takes too long to complete and too expensive. Why don't you become an engineer? It's low cost. Right, uh, all that. So there's a lot of friction between daughter and father. Whereas, instead of one person trying to impose his or her ideas on everybody else, what if people cared enough about others, the feelings of others in the family, and recognized their dreams and accepted their dreams, and supported and motivated them, right, in uh, in their own unique paths? Then there'll be a lot of love and affection, strong bonds of love and affection that will form in that family. Right and uh, and that and trust and that becomes a great foundation 
in such a family everybody will be, everybody will be successful right both parents will be successful in their careers and the kids also will be successful in their studies and education so health is obviously very important i mean i don't need to kind of belabor that but uh, <clears throat> so since you are all youngsters right you don't have to worry about you know diet and exercise and all that just get into some sports and that will work wonders for you like i'll give you an example i have a relative who is uh, about 85 years now he still fit as a fiddle right he does international travel and goes around you know, freely he used to go in his uh, you know scooter and then some of us we started with discouraging him to take his four wheel because it's unsafe right but he thinks he can manage so what is the secret it's very simple he was a tennis player all his life and not a professional player he's just is it's just a hobby but every week he would play at least uh, two three times and he, he feels restless if he didn't play that right uh, so that's it that's a very simple one simple secret otherwise he just eats whatever he wants and all that right so that that's a easy path to having a good health see if you can take up take that kind of a path and money is very good very important obviously right and to have a good life and i'm not a financial expert so i cannot say much about investments and all that but i can say something about the attitudes that some people have which keeps money from them coming from coming to them so some people think that money is the root of all evil on the on one hand you need money you want money you crave for money but again you feel that it's the root of all evil and it's bad so you cannot have that kind of a conflicting attitude towards money then it right i mean if you want to want to make friendship with somebody and if you think that person is very bad i mean how is the friendship even possible right so uh, so uh, some people think that uh, rich people are all bad or rich people become rich by looting poor people that's obviously not always true or you know not even often true because if, if there's nothing like a law of conservation of money like law of conservation of mass because if there is law of conservation of money the money of a nation will not grow right the sum total but gdp keeps growing right india especially gdp keeps growing this is at a very very high rate so uh, so so that's not true the more positive attitude towards money is money is generated basically by creative and diligent effort of individuals or groups or organizations so 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 therefore if you take a constructive attitude like that you know it's easier to you know align be aligned better towards money right so basically if you can fulfill a social need if you can identify your talent which can fulfill a social need then as you do that money will come to you automatically right so you need to ask yourself what is the hidden talent in you that can fulfill a social need and or serve the society next finally i mean it's it's i think one should have a beautiful vision of one's life so generally we keep you know kind of drifting through life you know day to day year to year taking whatever comes to us right without much forethought of what kind of life you want to have right you know be bold and envision a great life and it will happen if you if you can if you can envision a great life that itself will is half the half the homework done right have a very beautiful uh, loving dream of what kind of life you want to have what kind of city you want to live in what kind of workplace you want to work at what kind of family you want to have what kind of house you want to live in what kind of vehicle whatever it is right have a very concrete and vivid imagination of what kind of life you want to have right and uh, just like a novelist who writes the nice beautiful stories to think of your own life story and you know you you frame it and it will become true tomorrow right or you will be fully on the way to making it real so i want to quote from william james he says the greatest discovery of our generation is that human beings can alter their lives by altering their attitudes of mind but if you change your attitude change your thoughts change your beliefs and your reality your circumstances of life also will change accordingly so you can watch this movie called the founder it's the story of the founder of the mcdonalds restaurant chain so his name is ray crock right this guy initially began his life as a as a salesman as a door to door salesman he was getting sick of that life and found it very dull so he was listening to some of these motivational tapes and one of these these tapes he keeps hearing this message that is you change your mind change your attitude your reality will change right so he had a lot of belief in him he had a lot of dreams he wanted to do something else something much bigger something more more interesting more satisfying 
and slowly he knocked on several doors and made many efforts and then slowly he became a billionaire right he founded this empire of a mcdonald's food chain so so we talked a little something about this success the stories of success the principles of success so now this success has been written so much about that people have made a science of it if you read a bunch of books on success you will see that there is undercurrent of there is an outline of science that can be reduced to a bunch of principles so if you apply these principles and success, you know, achieve success taste success for yourself then once you found your feet once you find your you know your satisfying position in life and in society then you can give back to the society and help others right who are also struggling like you did you know, long ago right and if we, if we all did that in india india will become this because we are talking about you know prime minister is talking about a 5 to 3 trillion dollar trillion dollar economy and all that why 5 trillion we can even become 50 trillion dollar economy provided we understand what is success and how we can become successful so finally i just want to uh, just say that uh, we developed this novel script called bharati which is a unifying script for india india we have lots of languages uh, but this is a script which can write all these major languages of india it's a very simple script vikram has been popularizing it in lots of uh, village schools and kids are kids are able to pick it up in 15 minutes so it's a very easy script you can learn more information from this website called bharatiscript.com so the, i'm signing off and uh, in a jagin so if you have any questions i'll try to answer thank you very much sir it was really very uh, motivating and uh, interesting so many examples so now i request all the participants to ask any uh, questions if you have please ask and please take the cues in the chat box also any questions i'll try to answer if i don't know the answer i'll just say i don't know um, i may not be able to answer very specific questions like you know where can i get application form for infosys or something like that but uh, more general questions about career i can i'll try to answer yeah so basically what i'm saying is one of the key ideas in the talk is uh, right you know instead of worrying about what job you will get and where right just first you know see if you can fall in love with your subject become passionate about it and then things will happen naturally right uh, whereas we put the cart before the horse right we, we hardly talk about passion or you know love for the subject but we just talk about because career should not be something that you just do for money money will definitely come but uh, the work should be meaningful should be joyous joy is a key word all right it should give you joy and satisfaction then money will automatically come so seek that joy where do you have that joy in fact there is a very nice uh, mantra called follow your bliss all right if you follow your bliss then that should lead you to your great career so thing is you need to ask yourself well, where do you have that bliss what makes you happy which line of work so any questions participants you can unmute your mic and ask sir i will read out one question from one of the student by name atul Uh, yeah. he says how to come across yeah like we have circulated one sheet in which they can ask questions 
so uh, there is one person atul he is asking how to get in get out of the obstacles which we come across in life so okay this is a slightly general question i can say yeah, that, yeah general yeah yeah so don't worry about the obstacles do something that is positive right and then go towards that positive goal then obstacles will slowly recede by themselves right find your passion and for example uh, i don't know you could be in biotechnology you could be in maths whatever it is find some joy in that activity and maybe you can form as a small you know group of students who read books in that area and discuss them and share their joy right and share their learnings from you know with each other get inspired about it right inspired so obstacles will be there everybody has obstacles of all sorts of obstacles but leave them alone don't worry about them do something positive obstacles will slowly recede you'll see them receding becoming just disappearing over a period of time don't focus on obstacles <clears throat> so you were uh, uh, showing so many books uh, so we would like to have a link for that those books those i'll send you a list of books my i'll send you i have an excel sheet okay sir for all these books i'll send you that list okay sir okay thank you okay. Okay. If there are no other questions, uh, shall we call it a day? Ma'am, can we have a word of thanks? Otherwise, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We'll have a word of thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, sir, for making this session so vibrant. You said the qualities and mantras of a successful person. You made us aware of each and every content by giving real life experience. Thank you, sir. Now I request. Dr. Uma Maheshwari, Associate Professor, Department of Mathematics, CMS College of Science and Commerce, to propose a vote of thanks. Good afternoon to one and all. It is an honor for me to propose the vote of thanks on this occasion. First, I would like to thank Almighty for showering the blessings and making the program a great success. I am indebted to thank the management, CMS College of Science and Commerce, for their extreme support and encouragement. Next, I wish to place my sincere feelings of gratitude to our principal, Dr. H. Balakrishnan, for his continuous support. Thank you, sir. With a deep sense of gratitude, I owe my sincere and heartfelt thanks to the guest of the day, Dr. Z. Srinivasa Chakravarti, Professor, IIT Madras. We are really enlightened with your vast knowledge and experiences. Thank you, sir. I thank Dr. Mridra Ravindran, Head of the Department of Mathematics. She is the backbone of the department who took great pain in arranging the desk for today's program. Thank you, ma'am, for arranging this uh, wonderful session. Thank you, ma'am. I express my gratitude to the Star Coordinator of Math Department, Dr. D. Shrija, Associate Professor, Department of Math, for her support and kindness. Thank you, ma'am. I also thank all our department staff who stood behind this program to make it a success. I extend my sincere thanks to our college staff and students who attended the program. Long but not the least, I take the opportunity to express the feelings of gratefulness to all the participants of this program. Thank you, everyone. So thank you very much. And it's a glorious experience for me also. And hope uh, all the students will have great careers. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat>